I really want to start with uh, congrats on Sharper. But before I get into talking about your movie, um, I think Andor is the best thing on TV. And I just want to talk uh, just a touch about uh, your work on Andor, if you don't mind. Of course. I definitely want to know. I mean, you got to direct a number three, I believe three episodes on Andor. You got to do the finale. What was it like being part of a show like that, which is so beloved by so many people? Well, I, I mean, the, the honest answer to that is I, well, I didn't know that before. I mean, Star Wars generally being beloved by everyone. Just Andor, because people specifically love Andor. Yeah, that is, listen, that is great. But but obviously that's happened after we made it. But, uh, you know, at the time, there wasn't really a lot of, it didn't seem like there was a lot of heat on Andor. It felt that it was slightly, um, you know, it was just uh, uh, undercover and that this massive show was being made in Pinewood, but that people had somehow forgotten about it. And you have to bear in mind, I am not um, I am not the biggest Star Wars fan. And I, and I, and I don't mean that in any sort of um, uh, mean way. I just mean, I, I, from a kid I was, but I sort of, I just maybe fell out of love with it, or I sort of hadn't followed it sort of as I, um, in my later years. So and I and I declared that to Tony really early on. I said, "Look, Tony, I, I, if you if you want, is this a question about sort of um, what's been going on in Star Wars recently? I, I have no idea. I mean, look, I'll happily go and watch uh, the last few films, but I I haven't seen them. And he was like, "No, that's great. We don't want, we don't want fan service. We want uh, you know. I, I've deliberately seen you know. I, I I'm aware of your work and I and I like your work and I want that work in." In Andor, and so um, so that that's how it came about. And I responded to his writing. You know, he, he, I I hadn't I hadn't I hadn't read I hadn't read anything like that for for a long time. And I sort of forgot that I genuinely forgot that it was Star Wars. You know, there were no you know there was no lightsabers, there was no Darth Vader, there was none of the Force. It was just really well drawn out um, narratives and great characters that I just wanted to spend time with. And that that's as a director or me personally, that's that's what I respond to. And I guess that's where it all started. And then when we were filming, I mean, you know, I just approach it like anything else I do. You know, just. You direct it. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I think that's the reason why Andor is so good is because you could it could be if you took the Star Wars out of it, it would still be an amazing show. Do you know what it is? I mean, we should move on sharper, but I just really, for me, it was a spy thriller. It was a thriller. And I guess, look, you know, you know, Tony Gilroy. I mean, I love Bourne and I love my, but it was a spy thriller. And I, and I thought that is, I could, that's what I lent into. Yes, it was in the Star Wars universe, but it was a spy thriller. And so I lent into that, um, you know, that, that kind of tone and mood. So one of the things I really thought was cool is that, um, without spoilers, each yeah. chapter of the film essentially is its own aesthetic. And I'm curious, what is it like as a director when you obviously have to film certain locations on the same day that are taking place in the different chapters on the same day when you're going for sort of a different look? Like the beginning looks almost like a romantic New York City yeah. movie. Well, that's, I mean, the answer is preparation. You know, like anything, you just got to be, you got to be a really good student. You got to be really well prepared. You got to have all of those conversations before you go out and start filming, you know, with your, with your sort of, with your, with your crew. I guess, um, you know, we sort of broke it down. I was, I, um, I, we, I remember we had this we had this mood board in the in the design department and it was and it sort of went through all of the different chapters and it was and you could and, I, and it was like a colorway it was amazing so the sort of first chapter were, were those kind of Wong Kar Wai beautiful um, kind of oranges and reds and greens of spring and then we sort of got to the second chapter and it was more like tungsten and yellow and and it, and it almost devoid of color so those and then so on and so on so they were you know that was was that was pretty much um, a kind of guiding principle from the beginning throughout the chapters and then um, with the actors we had a rehearsal process where we kind of um, well I made the story more linear so that we could kind of go through it in the in in the sort of the again trying not to give any too much away but sort of going through it in a in, in a in a in a you know how the, how the story would have played out, and then and then you just bottle all that up, and you you're, you're back on set. So I, you know it's funny. You talk about shooting out sequence. I think on one day we shot the beginning of the movie, and on the next day we shot the end of the movie because the the film, excuse the pun, but you know bookends 
beginning and end of the film takes place in the bookstore. And so, um, you know, but I'm, I'm used to that. I'm, and, and I think most filmmakers are, are used to that now because, uh, you know, whether it's on uh, episodic television or, you know, feature films now, you know, no, not it's a luxury now to shoot... Uh, anything in sequence, you know, it's just, um, it's a, certainly a location-based movie. You're, you know, you, you you just, we wouldn't be able to achieve the ambition of this film in the places I want to go to, racing across the whole of New York City if we were going to shoot it in um, sequence. One of the things about this film, I, I like talking about editing because that's where everything comes together. But especially with this film, because of the non-linear or like the editing is incredibly important to this film because you're figuring out how much do you want to give away and when. So can you sort of talk about the challenges you ran into in the editing room, maybe how the film changed in ways you didn't expect? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess well, generally, I, I, I when I first read this, I embraced and loved the fact that this was sort of a non-linear narrative and that, you know, it's, um, you know, where the structure itself sort of echoes the, the story's tricks and turns. My long time collaborator Jan Miles and I've worked together for I think now 10 12 years we worked together right from the beginning of the season of the crown and he edited the andor with me so we have a, a, a sort of a real um, understanding and love of exactly as you're referring to the sort of playfulness that you can explore in editing um, one of the things we um, you know we we, we the end of the movie wasn't quite as finished as uh, when we, you know, in, in, the, in the early script stage and even when, so when we'd finished it. So uh, I, rem I remember there was a day when I came into the cutting room and um, uh, I, I sort of pulled out this big piece of paper and I sort of, I, I wrote out the film in linear fashion. And for a moment he started, Jan was like, he's lost the plot. He basically wants me to sort of re-edit the movie and put it back into sort of non, you know, linear. And, and then I was like, no, 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 we've got, this is all to do with um, the last chapter and how um, I think I'd just seen Usual Suspects and I, and, I, and I wanted this idea that there was this, you know, this story that we could take from the rest of the film that would, um, uh, give us this final act that uh, was was it was there it was kind of all it was there all along but you didn't see it the film there was another message in the film that we could sort of use at the end so that that came together completely in the cutting room that sort of final act um, yes we you know yes I'd shot I'd always shot sort of bits along the way that I knew that could form part of this big kind of puzzle or this big jigsaw, you know, big jigsaw puzzle at the end. But it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't really clear to me what the kind of through line was. And that was something we definitely discovered in the in the edit. And then I, I love, um, you know, uh, with Jan, I love um, intercutting sequences. I love um, sort of, you know, going with the story and then meanwhile something happens here. So in the Tom chapter, a lot of those scenes that you see between Tom and Sandra in the kitchen were actual scenes, you know, there were actual proper scenes between the two of them. But we, there was a kind of, there was a pacing issue around that time. Um, I wanted to, I wanted there to be a kind of classical, you know, for all intents and purposes, an independent, an indie rom-com montage. You know, and so we had that piece of music by Curtis Harding and we started amalgamating those scenes into kind of more broken up moments with um, with like sort of other um, kind of non-dialogue scenes that we shot either up on the rooftop of um, in, you know, in Times Square. And we sort of, you know, I like to I say we put it in the washing machine, we put it all in the washing machine, we jumble all around and it sort of comes out with that. And that, so those things, definitely were discoveries in the you know in the in the editing process so did you end up with a lot of deleted scenes that's a, well so there yes there's one what do we there's two scenes that we had to cut and one one scene or uh was in that was basically about a, a sort of max and madeline origin story and we shot it in Washington Square Park. It was a great scene. Uh, it was it was a sort of it was a it was a, 
uh, a flashback. It was about maybe five years before any of our story takes place. And it came after, in the script, it came after um, Max's chapter and before Madeline's chapter. And we tried it and we ran it, but it was like a, it was like a pebble in the shoe. It just broke up the, I say the flow, but there was something pure about the timeline or the non-linear timeline. And that actually sort of disrupted it. Um, so we lost that and it freed it up a little bit. And, and in a way it was sad because it sort of understood a bit more about Max's character and Madeline's character. But in, in a way, there's, I'm never afraid of leaving those questions out there, you know, that you can sort of leave some of that in the audience. And then there was another scene, one other scene was in, um, in Tom's chapter between Tom and Sandra and uh, it was sort of after the bookstore, after the birthday party at the bookstore, it was between the two of them and Sandra is giving um, Tom a present and there was something, that present, and I can't tell you what it is because it's going to give away, it's, like, it's a plot spoiler, but there was something in that present that uh, again disrupted how you felt about Sandra and so we had to lose that scene. So only two. Not bad. Um, I already got a wrap with you. I'm just going to say uh, congrats on the movie uh, and that you don't have to worry about the opening weekend box office. And I look forward to whatever you're doing next. Yeah, that's a relief. I think that's a relief. We don't have to worry about that. I mean, yeah, especially right now. I mean, it doesn't feel very fair to be um, judged on that. So, yeah, that is a relief. Seriously, looking forward to what you do next. Oh, thank you. And thanks for thanks for saying all the lovely things you did. I appreciate that. Not a problem. Have a great day. 